Welcome to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast, where the cross and the culture are on a collision course for discussion. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require signs, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, here's your host, Thomas Irvin. In 1411, the success of a revolution was sealed. The widowed queen of Henry III of Castile signed the treaty that brought peace to Portugal. To celebrate the newfound peace, the king determined a tournament should be held. The tournament would be a form of competition between the king's three sons, Duarte, Peter, and Henry. Plans were being established when a better idea was presented to the king. An advisor, John Afonso suggested something more worthwhile be implemented in celebration, something like conquering a useful territory. His sons were greatly interested in this idea. They were excited at the prospect of battle. But the king was uh, uncertain. What sort of expedition would it be? What would be suitable? His advisor, John Afonso, suggested Sueta. The king responded positively to this suggestion, almost immediately jumping at the idea. Portugal and Spain were constantly at war, but Spain was particularly troubled by the Moors. The Moors used Sueta as a stronghold that allowed them to continually trouble them. Its capture would place Portugal in a great position to further dominate Spain if necessary. Suweta was a small area in North Africa, nigh unto Morocco. Indeed, an invasion of Suweta may require an invasion of Morocco as well. The three sons of King John of Portugal were alike in their discipline, but very different in personalities. Prince Duarte had a faithful sense of duty. This led him to, this led him to an early grave. Prince Peter's mind was steeped in his studies of philosophy. As such, he was a deep thinker. Now, Prince Henry, he was the adventurous one. He was a man of action that dreamed of conquest upon the high seas. These three were dedicated to faithfully serving their father, the king. King John began to lay out the realities of the battle to his sons. Second-guessing himself, he first informed them uh, they did not have the money and that taxing the people to raise the money would not be possible. The people of Portugal had just funded the war with the Castiles in Spain. The king believed it would be a cruel request to tax them further. Secondly, Portugal did not possess a fleet large enough to transport the army necessary to Sueta for this battle. Third, the army Portugal did have was not sufficient for the battle if they were able to transport them. <laughs> the young men believed their father was exaggerating the negatives purposefully. They listened intently, then they respectfully offered their rebuttals. It took a few days, but they eventually convinced their father to move forward with the impossible conquest. They would proceed with plans they would secretly gather recon, and then they would organize men on a need-to-know basis. To accomplish this feat, 
they would need to become acquainted with Suetta, its layout, its ports, and any useful information that would allow for a surprise attack. A certain military priest was hired to help with this. The prior of the Hospitallers was secretly employed to perform the necessary espionage. On a trip to Sicily, he managed to stop in at the Suetta port. While there, he gathered valuable information to assist with the battle plans. The king became overly excited at the prospect of battle. So much so, he left his eldest son Duarte in charge of the kingdom, while he and his two younger sons worked together to assemble a large army. His son Duarte put his all into the management of the kingdom, but such weighty matters would cause his health to fail. Thus, his health was undermined by his great zeal for his duties in managing the kingdom. The prior of Hospitallers returned to Portugal with the long-desired reconnaissance. Over a meal, the prior sat quietly, almost excited to be the man in the room with all the info. He relished this highly mysterious position that brought him sudden importance. As he sat and ate, the meal provided him, the king and his sons were across the table, anxiously expecting a full account. They got silence. That is until the king directly asked him about the matter. The prior responded strangely. He respectfully denied to answer, requesting certain odd materials be brought to him so that he could answer in a very specific manner. He requested a reel of ribbon, two sacks of sand, a porringer, and a half bushel of beans. The king laughingly responded, Are you a wizard preparing an incantation? The prior, understanding the danger he may be causing himself with such an odd request, fell on his face before the king. He earnestly reassured the king this was an honest request meant to assist with his explaining the information he had gathered. The king consented. The curious articles were expressly delivered and taken into the adjoining room. The king and his son sat patiently while the prior prepared his materials. Once ready, the doors to the adjoining room opened and the king and his sons were invited to enter. The prior informed the king as a result of what he had created, he could not only answer any questions the king might have, but he could visually show him as well. On the stone floor was a large, essentially 3D map detailing all the needed information to effectively attack Suenta. This form of visual aid had a great effect on Prince Henry. He quietly and thoughtfully examined the scene before him. It became clear to the young prince the whole world could be depicted in this manner and that such a tool would be of great value. His ability to think critically on these matters are probably what led him to start one of the great nautical schools of his day. It may be this moment marked the beginnings of scientific navigation. This was a major development, and now it was time to carefully divulge the information to them that needed to know, the queen being amongst the first of them. King John informed her of the planned expedition, as well as the great details provided them. She was excited at the prospect, but she did wonder about her king. He spent many years in battle, fighting for the peace of Portugal. They have finally obtained that peace. She wondered if he should not remain home and enjoy the calm of his kingdom in his latter years. But the king's great zeal for this operation, coupled with the idea of leading the battle with his loyal sons, meant he would not be convinced otherwise. Like a faithful warhorse, the king could taste his battle. And on August 12th, 1415, the battle would commence. Portugal entered African soil. The battle was hot. Soweto responded quickly to the invasion. To make matters worse, as the battle increased, a storm began to rage. The storm caused great confusion. The Portuguese were scattered across the ocean. It took them at least one week to regroup. Now when the crews reassembled, 
much argument took place about what to do next. Yet the king was resolved. They would return to Sueta and finish the expedition. They arrived by night, surprising the Moors with an attack hidden by darkness. The Portuguese swept the city effortlessly. Eight lives were lost by the Portuguese forces. Soon after, the castle was raided and easily taken. This victory was of great significance. It was among the first of important moves to check Islamic expansion. Secondly, it marked the start of maritime exploration. Europe was now on African soil. Possession of this land would create a bottleneck preventing Islam's future expansion. It is important to make a note here. Portugal invaded this Islamic territory under the banner of the cross. Secular history's account of these battles read in such a way to be critical of what they call Christianity's and Islam's conquering attitudes. Allow me to correct this misinformation. This battle was between two religious organizations. This was not a battle between Christians and Muslims. This was Roman Catholicism versus Islam. Christians do not engage in the conquering of foreign lands in the name of Christ. We don't conquer foreign lands in the name of anyone. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We desire living souls that are lost to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, often at our own peril. Religion desires to force your conversion at the threat of death. They intend to institute a theocracy that will dominate your life. This is the nature of religion. It is not descriptive of Christianity. While Portugal was in possession of Sueta, Prince Henry was placed in charge of its protection. He indeed had to set sail at some point from Portugal to Sueta with a large fighting force to repel an invasion. His success began to stir grand ideas in the heart of this young prince. He came to be known as Prince Henry the Navigator. He imagined a great empire. It would start with Portugal, extend to Morocco, and eventually, at least in his vision, cover all of Africa. He began to speculate. Just how far does this African coastline extend? In 1444, Prince Henry the Navigator dispatched his ships for discovery. They traveled down the west coast, and eventually, in time, they rounded the Cape of Good Hope. Over the years, the perverted doctrines of Roman Catholicism would be spread as they opened Catholic mission stations down the west coast. Portugal and its Catholic influence embedded itself in the region between the Congo River and Angola. A native African king in the area converted to Catholicism and renamed this territory San Salvador. This area would eventually come to be dominated by Jesuit priests, also well known as wolves in sheep's clothing. These priestly devils would churn out generations of indigenous clergy, causing Congo to remain a Catholic state for some 140 years. Of course, these pious Catholics were all too helpful in establishing the slave trade. Prince Henry himself returned to Portugal with 200 slaves. He sold them and generously gave one-fifth of the money to the Catholic Church. The theft of free men would eventually become so profitable that Catholic popes would join in the enterprise. Catholic popes had key interests in the slave trade and they were highly influential in the endeavors of Portugal and Spain. By the 17th century, Angola's only function was to supply slaves for the trade headed to the New World. By 1665, Angola had essentially become a barren wasteland. As a result, the Catholic King of Portugal at that time invaded the Catholic Kingdom of Congo. Angola became a punishment station for unruly priests, many of whom lived openly depraved lives. They collected concubines, even at a time when they were required to obey that doctrine of devils and forbidding to marry. Their active involvement in the slave trade was horrendous. Such unrighteous activity has nothing to do with Christianity. 
On the East Coast, Rome's influence was just as bloody. The Catholics placed great pressure for the Ethiopian church to come under submission to Roman paganism. It, of course, ended in bloodshed and was a total failure. In 1688, some 244 years after Prince Henry the Navigator set sail for Africa, four Dutch Quakers from Germantown, Pennsylvania, produced the first protest against slavery on record. In their protest, they noted their God was no respecter of persons. The souls of black men belong to the Savior. Furthermore, they concluded the robbers that steal men from their homeland and the men that buy stolen men are one and the same. Over the course of the 17th century, the Enlightenment took shape, and men came to propagate perceived realities of natural law. As a result, they came to believe all men were created equal and had certain inalienable rights endued by a transcendent power. This would begin to change the governmental course of history. The next great debate would be whether or not these inalienable rights also belong to slaves. Men invested in the slave trade had come to the conclusion the alien races were less than human. This idea would be further propagated in the 1800s by the beloved Charles Darwin. We will be certain to provide very specific quotations for our atheist friends and social justice warriors both of whom tend to propagate the teachings of Darwinian evolution while at the same time condemning racism, which seems to be a high level of confusion. These important series of events bring us to 1731. Count Zinzendorf, the German reformer and bishop of the Moravian Church, was invited to the coronation of the King of Denmark, Christian VI. Through the course of celebratory activities, Count Zinzendor found himself engaged in a conversation with a black servant named Anthony Ulrich. Ulrich gave rich and horrifying details regarding the condition of slaves in the West Indies. Zinzendorf was greatly moved by this conversation, which seems to indicate the best way to develop a burden for people would be to interact with people. Count Zinzendorf returned home to Herrenhut and began to share the news of what he had learned. For Christians, the Moravians must be specially noted and fondly remembered. They took up the mantle of missions with such authenticity as to be warmly remembered by God's people. The Moravians called themselves Unitas Fratrum, meaning the unity of the brethren. Would to God such an attitude would return to Bible-believing people the world over. They appear to have their birth amongst the Utraquist, who were descendants of John Huss. As time passed, a group assembled among them became more zealous in their doctrine and required more reform of the recognized Lutheran churches. The existence of such zeal eventually required that these believers separate and begin their own church. In search of accomplishing this, they sent brethren to a colony of Waldensians then living in Moravia. As the Reformation began, these brethren were warm towards the Reformers. Though no seamless relationships were facilitated, the Reformers were correct to break from Rome, but they did not go far enough to establish clear biblical doctrine for this group of believers. Yet Luther did notice them. He is quoted as saying, Since the time of the Apostles, no church has as nearly resembled the apostolic churches. In 1610, they became a legally recognized church in Bohemia. By the time of the Counter-Reformation and the Thirty Years' War, they came under great persecution. Their Roman Catholic persecutors were convinced they had eradicated this church of dissenters. Yet they remained, and they were able to disguise themselves so as to hide from Jesuit spies. Eventually, a young carpenter by the name of Christian David was sent to travel and labor throughout Germany. His purpose was to find some Protestant safe haven where they might migrate and settle in safety. It took some three years, but in May of 1722, word came that a young nobleman 
Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf was willing to give them refuge. They would travel quickly. They left behind anything that could not be quickly grabbed and carried. They made their way to Zinzendorf's estate in Saxony. They named their new home Herrenhut, which means Watch of the Lord. Over the next seven years, Moravians from all over Moravia would brave the journey to settle in Herrenhut. Some 300 brethren settled there together. They became a flourishing and respected religious community. Count Zinzendorf and his bride came to know the Moravians very well. He was impressed by their respectful piety and was happy to show them his favor. Zinzendorf was friendly toward the gospel. He would even consider himself a preacher thereof. He did not consider breaking from the Lutheran church, but rather he intended on establishing a religious society that believers could join. Yet he soon learned this was not going to be practical, and his attempt to accomplish this brought him gradually closer to politics, of which he was trying to get away from. It was around this time he became highly interested with the newfound colony at Herrenhut. In 1727, he resigned his office at Dresden, and he joined the Moravians. In the years to come, he would give his all to his Moravian brethren. Eventually, he would have that providential conversation with Anthony Ulrich in Denmark. Ulrich was soon invited to visit Herrenhut. While there, he told about the physical troubles and the spiritual condition of his people in the West Indies. Two Moravians were particularly moved by this news. Leonhard Dober, a potter, and David Nitschmann, a carpenter, gave up the newfound security they had established in Germany to go and preach the gospel in the West Indies. They would give themselves over as slaves so that as slaves, they could preach the gospel amongst slaves. They left their homes in 1732, and in time, they were gospel-preaching slaves in the West Indies. Before now, one would be hard-pressed to find anyone that had shown any concern for the souls of Africans. They could rightfully say amongst men, no man careth for my soul. But they could not turn such complaints toward heaven. The Lord stirred the heart of these men in a unique way to serve him, not as servants, but as voluntary slaves. Until now, the Muslims and the Africans could only relate Christianity with a banner that was sure to have bloodthirsty Europeans to follow. Yet, on the other hand, the Moravians esteemed others better than themselves, and they chose to let the mind of Christ be in them. Now, these men were greatly opposed. They often came under persecution. They were often prevented, but they never gave up. They would serve their masters by day, and teach the slaves the word of God by night. The work spread from St. Thomas to St. Croix, then to St. John. Later the work would make its way to Jamaica, St. Christopher's, Antigua, Barbados, and the surrounding small islands. Notice these men gave themselves and took nothing. A stark difference from the greedy hordes under the banner of the crescent moon or the Catholic Church. The death rate of the missionaries was great, but they never failed to provide a willing replacement ready to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as slaves preaching the gospel in those islands. Their ministry would continually expand. They made their way to South and Central America. They labored in Greenland. They went to Alaska. They settled amongst lepers. But most important to our current conversation, they made their way to Africa. The Moravians are a great example of heroic self-sacrifice for the cause of Jesus Christ. No doubt in losing their lives, 
they have assuredly saved them. In making themselves last for the sake of others, we yearn to see the day when they shall be made first. In 1736, Zinzendorf was banished from Saxony. The Protestant church began to take on the characteristics of its Catholic roots. They would not have the rogue group of believers operating outside their authority. But parallel with this banishment was the work of a man named George Schmidt. In South Africa, the Dutch settlers were content with taking all they desired. George Schmidt, back in Herrenhut, resolved to give his life to the Hottentots of South Africa. He labored there as long as he could. Needing to make his way temporarily to Europe, this trip would be used against him. Word spread quickly to Europe that this man was simply there for the spiritual benefit of the African natives. Therefore, European businessmen worked together to prevent him from returning to Africa. The idea was that missionaries concerned for the well-being of the African would hurt trade. So for 50 years, missionaries were not allowed to enter the Cape. Eventually, in 1792, German missionaries found their way into the Cape of Good Hope again. They traveled to what was the home of George Smith and restarted the work there. Even 50 years later, they found some remnant of the work he started before. The missionaries were treated harshly by the Boers, and often they were threatened with death. Yet the Lord protected them and cared for them. Eventually, a drastic change in the Cape brought them relief and a change of attitude toward their work. The English nation took control of Cape Colony. This would establish a marked difference, not only in South Africa, but in world missions. The light in the dark continent began to fade away almost as soon as it had started to flicker. Yet in 1792, German missionaries are now present. The English have taken the Cape, and they would allow missionaries to make their way to South Africa freely. More importantly, in 1795, back in England, a young boy had just made his introduction into our present evil world. He was a Scotsman. He would come to be known as the Gardener. He loved the idea of shipwork on the high seas. His name was Robert Moffat. And to learn more about him, you'll have to come back next week. Thank you for listening, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can learn more about our ministry by visiting www.plenteousredemption.com. You can hear more Plenteous Redemption podcast audio at www.plenteousredemption.media. Please comment below if this podcast has been a help to you. Also, inform us of future topics that would interest you. Thank you again for listening to the Plenteous Redemption podcast.